My dear friends, this video is on a novelist who is the favorite of all of us, Jane Austen. She has written some five novels which are extremely famous and these novels show 18th and 19th century domestic life, women's lives, their priorities, experiences, concerns, ambitions and marriages. The novels of Jane Austen are called domestic realism. There are some stereotypical characters, stereotypical situations. In the first reading it looks like Are, Jane Austen is not that great. She writes in a very traditional conventional manner. I don't like her. There are so many writers better than Jane Austen you will feel probably. But many critics, many people have pointed out that Jane Austen novels have a subtle power. Some brilliant moments where the character shines through. You know, I feel like uh, similar to when Wordsworth talks about spots of time. Some epiphanic moments in the novel. There is no epiphany in the novel. But some moments in the novel that are pregnant with meaning. That is what makes Jane Austen's characters and novels enduring successes. Jane Austen was born in 1775. That was the year in which Charles Lamb was also born. And she was born at Steventon in Hampshire. I have Encyclopedia Volume 2 in front of me. Recently brought out in a second edition with new information. And Jane Austen was the daughter of a clergyman. Oh no. <laughs> Why? Because that brought her a very protected cloistered life. She did not have a lot of experience in life, especially 19th century women did not have. She wrote about a small canvas, a bit of ivory, nine inches wide. That is what is uh, famously said about her novels. But she brought into that bit of ivory so much brilliant expression. Haven't you seen miniature ivory uh, sculptures? So Jane Austen was from a big family. She had six brothers and one sister Cassandra to whom she was very close. And she went to a clergyman's daughter's school, boarding school and eventually she got Typhus fever there. She only lived for some 41 years. And within that, that time, she did a lot of reading. She did a lot of writing. She also moved house from Steventon to Bath, then Charton. You know, all these places, there are Jane Austen museums. Capturing the quality of life uh, in Austin's time and it is in her 30s when she was like 30 plus years old that is when she wrote her novels and published them anonymously in the Jane Austen museums the little table which she used for writing the ink pot all these are there displayed in the museum you can take the quill and uh, write something for Jane Austen on the register kept there. I said, Dear Jane, when I went to the museum, I wrote, I remember, Dear Jane, thank you so much for leaving us these wonderful novels. It is a rich treasure. I wrote, I remember, beautiful to go to that house, experience all that, you know, the clothes. The, in one of the museums, the people who were waiting on us were dressed as Jane Austen characters. I was waited on by Louisa Musgrove. Louisa and Henrietta Musgrove, the Musgrove sisters from Persuasion. So that was beautiful. Now let me talk about Jane Austen's novels. When Jane was only 15 years old, 
she wrote love and friendship it is a burlesque on samuel richardson samuel richardson was a very important influence on jane samuel richardson's influence is there in sense and sensibility also she was against sensibility and that early novel was an immature work her first mature work was northanger abbey but it was not published at that time it has the youngest heroine in jane austen novels catherine morland she is only a 17 year old girl eventually northanger abbey was published after jane austen's death jane austen passed in 1817 the very next year northanger abbey and the last novel persuasion were published together the first published novel of jane austen was sense and sensibility 1811 followed by pride and prejudice in 1813 and then came mansfield park the very next year in 1814 followed by emma in 1814 it's uh, 1816 written in 1814 published in 1816 sense and sensibility pride and prejudice mansfield park emma only four novels were published in her lifetime northanger abbey and persuasion later persuasion has the oldest heroine ann eliot who is in her 30s so now is the time to talk about these novels sense and sensibility is the first published work of jane austen it was published anonymously under the name a lady the original title of sense and sensibility was elinor and marian they are the heroines the female protagonists and this novel is in epistolary form even in later novels like pride and prejudice there are so many letters written by characters to each other the story of sense and sensibility is primarily the romantic attachments heartbreaks and marriages of the two sisters elinor and marian but beyond that the novel is also about social class money issues and also the cultural dichotomy the cultural binary opposition between sense represented by elinor and sensibility or emotion represented by marian what is the historical context i should explain at this point the augustan age was a time when reason rationalism was given a lot of importance slowly towards the end of the augustan age this changed over into romantic sensibilities the coming of romanticism was at first frowned upon at first people frowned upon this extreme emotionalism but later the emergent emotionalism came to stay it became the chief feature of the age towards the end of the 19th century so the novel sense and sensibility is about the need to temper emotion or sentimentality with sense marian is learning a few lessons not to be so over emotional as i already mentioned money matters are very important in this novel the whole novel centers on the dashwood inheritance mr henry dashwood has died he had a first wife in who with whom he had a son mr john dashwood john dashwood is married to mrs dashwood now henry dashwood has also a second wife that is mrs dashwood who is the mother of elinor and marian getting me elinor and marian therefore have a half brother that is mr john dashwood after the death of mr henry dashwood obviously the dashwood estate goes to the son the second wife and her two daughters become destitute mr and mrs john dashwood do not care for mrs henry dashwood and elinor and marian so 
they have to leave that house and go and live elsewhere the property rights of women women's inheritance rights these are all important issues in novels like sense and sensibility and pride and prejudice these are all subtle ideas uh, discussed in the novel which provide the novel great power now mrs john dashwood has a brother edward faras actually she has more than one brother we will come to those brothers later he is a very good hearted gentleman and he has a liking for elinor elinor has a liking for him as well their affection is quiet they don't express it there is no proposal only in their hearts they like each other because of the power of the sense they know that before it is time prematurely they should not fall in love and express it so mrs dashwood now mrs henry dashwood that is with her two daughters moved to barton park with the help of a relative so they now separated from their own barton sorry uh, so they now separated from their own dashwood estate there is a man in his 30s colonel brandon he is also a quiet and good gentleman but he is not that young he takes an interest in marianne the pretty sensitive sensitive girl marianne marianne doesn't like him because he is too old for her are the novel suggests that you should not be looking at the age of a man you should be looking at whether he is good hearted whether he is good enough marianne makes a wrong decision to reject colonel brandon and to fall in love with the dashing young man john willoughby <laughs> always in these early novels of the 19th century dashing young men should not be trusted if somebody is smart and dashing then it is probable that he will cheat the girl <laughs> that is the stereotypical situation anyway the same thing happens here john willoughby is expressive about his love so is marianne they are so much visibly in love and john willoughby does things like gift marianne an expensive horse elinor is shocked don't take such expensive gifts you are not even engaged to him there is no proposal even that is how El elinor takes it marianne doesn't listen marianne thinks her over emotional nature is good and she trusts john willoughby she believes in ideal love so the lovers are over emotional behaving according to sensibility rather than sense now complications happen elinor gets the impression hears the news that edward faraz is engaged to marry lucy steel a very practical young girl and he has even married her well that was a wrong news anyway because lucy still knew that edward faraz is not rich he is not inheriting the money his brother is inheriting the money and she went and married his brother edward faraz is available for elinor to marry at the end marianne at this time learns from colonel brandon that willoughby has married a rich girl willoughby writes her a jilting letter saying I'm sorry I couldn't help it my family pushed me into marrying the rich girl she is jilted she is dramatically grieving and sad and then she realizes her sister was right it is better to be driven by sense than sensibility marianne learns her lesson she learns to control her emotions and then at the end elinor marries edward ferraz marianne marries colonel brandon so the right matches happen sense wins over sensibility that is the novel sense and sensibility now are you ready to discuss the novel pride and prejudice pride and prejudice was published in 1813 the title pride and prejudice was taken from fanny burney's novel cecilia memoirs of an heiress 
As you probably know, the original title of Pride and Prejudice was First Impressions. In the first impression, Elizabeth Bennet becomes prejudiced against Darcy and Darcy is proud. So that is why the novel is titled Pride and Prejudice. This novel is set in the countryside of Hertfordshire, which is outside of London. There are two houses, Netherfield Park and Longbourn. In Longbourn lives the Bennets. Mrs. Bennet, who is slightly lower in class than her husband, has only one aim, somehow to get her daughters married. Because if one of them is not married, the property will go to Mr. Collins, their relative. Look at the problematic property rights of women. They have to be married, there should be a man. Otherwise women cannot inherit property. It's not fair. What to do? In those days it was like that. So Mrs. Bennett gets excited because a young man in possession of a fortune moves into Netherfield Park. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. That is Charles Bingley who moves into Netherfield Park with his sister Carolyn. He has another sister who is married. Her name is Mrs. Hurst. And Bingley throws a party for all the people of the locality. The five Bennet sisters take place in the ball. The eldest beautiful Jane, she's quiet and shy and modest. The second intelligent and witty Elizabeth, who, is, who has taken after her father. The third pretentious and scholarly Mary. The fourth and fifth sisters are Lydia and Kitty who are very uh, I wouldn't say, they are flirtatious and playful. Eventually Lydia even runs away. That story has to wait. So this is how the novel begins. As soon as they meet each other, Bingley and Jane fall in love. But Jane is modest. She doesn't express her desire or emotions very freely. At the ball, the Bennet sisters also meet Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy. He is the owner of Pemberley Estate. The Bennet sisters do not like him. He looks proud and arrogant and stuck up. Oh, he even says about Elizabeth. She is not handsome enough to tempt me. Elizabeth immediately becomes prejudiced against Darcy. Because he doesn't speak to anyone in the neighborhood. He's too proud. And... Uh, Bingley and Jane, when Bingley is excited about Jane, Darcy even tries to prevent Bingley from pursuing his interest. Later we come to know that it's because Darcy suspects that Jane is not interested. So this is how the novel proceeds. Now, the sisters Elizabeth and Jane both travel a little bit in the novel. Bingley suddenly leaves to London. He intended to come back. But Jane is upset. Jane worries that he may leave her and go and not come back. So to distract her, she is taken on a journey. And Elizabeth also goes on a journey with her uncle and aunt, Mr. and Mrs. Gardner's. At this time, the Bennet sisters know one Wickham. Wickham is actually a gambler and a womanizer, but he's pretending to be such a nice gentleman. And Elizabeth rather foolishly believes him. He co cooks up a story of how he was the favorite of Darcy's father, and Darcy's father would have given him money, but Darcy prevented him from getting his inheritance. Elizabeth can't believe how cruel and mean Darcy can be. She is even more prejudiced now. And then Darcy had been noticing that Elizabeth is intelligent. 
Elizabeth is more beautiful than she at first seemed. At first, he had said, she's tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. But that man changed and proposed to Elizabeth. Elizabeth rejects him and tells him that she doesn't like Darcy intervening in Jane and Bingley's affair. She doesn't like the way Darcy intervened with Wickham getting his inheritance. Darcy doesn't reply. Later he writes a letter to her explaining that it is because he thought Bingley is forcing himself upon Jane. Jane is not interested. That is why he discouraged Bingley. And also Wickham got his inheritance and squandered it. And then he wanted to seduce Darcy's little sister, 15 year old Georgiana. Elizabeth realizes that, oh my God, it was a misunderstanding. Darcy is not so mean, not so bad. She is regretting her actions. At that time, Elizabeth gets a letter from Jane saying, revealing one terrible news, Lydia has run away with Wickham. It becomes clear what a terrible man Wickham is. The Bennet sisters will be disgraced. Nobody is going to marry him, marry them, any one of them. And at this time, Darcy intervenes, brings back Wickham and Lydia, gets them married. And uh, Elizabeth is now completely changed towards Darcy. Let us leave them there. Let me go back and introduce you to two characters whom I did not mention till now. One is Mr. Collins. The other is his patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Lady Catherine de Bourgh is the aunt of Darcy. She is a very snobbish, upper class aristocratic woman who doesn't like Elizabeth. Obstinate, headstrong girl, she calls Elizabeth. She asks Mr. Williams, sorry, Mr. Collins, who is going to be the heir of Mr. Bennet. She asks him, to go and marry one of the poor Bennet girls so that they will not be deprived of their inheritance because if Mr. Collins marries somebody else the property of the Bennets will go to Mr. Collins and his wife so in a very condescending manner in a very pretentious manner Mr. Collins comes and proposes to Elizabeth and Elizabeth rejects him she's not interested He's no good. Mr. Collins is shocked. And Mrs. Bennet can't believe it. Their only chance of retaining the property is going out of their hands. And you know what? Mr. Collins in a huff goes and marries Elizabeth's sister, Charlotte Lennox. This is a marriage of convenience. When Elizabeth visits Charlotte in Kent. That is when she meets Lady Catherine de Bourgh. And now Elizabeth has changed towards Darcy. Darcy wants to propose to Elizabeth and Lady Catherine de Bourgh knows this. Lady Catherine de Bourgh comes, meets Elizabeth and says, if my nephew Darcy is going to propose to you, you should reject it. You should not marry him. Elizabeth says, I will do what I want. Lady Catherine de Bourgh is rebuffed. She's belittled and she goes and tells Darcy, that obstinate girl is not listening to me. And then Darcy realizes, oh, she still has a soft corner for me. He proposes to her and she accepts it. Bingley and Jane, Darcy and Elizabeth, Lydia and Wickham, all these matches are now fixed and okay. The greatness of Elizabeth's character is that she realizes her mistake. She is ready to change. She tells her father, father, I'm going to marry Darcy. And he says, are you sure? Because you didn't want to in the beginning. 
And she says, no, in the beginning I was wrong. Now I have changed my mind. I want to do this. I'm sure of it. See, that is strength of character. It's human to make mistakes, but you have to be apologetic about it. You have to regret your mistake and correct them. That is what Elizabeth does. The epilogue of the novel tells us that they lived happily ever after. So this is a novel that deals with a lot of important issues. Shall I read from the encyclopedia? It is considered a classic because of its economy of narrative and elegance of style. Clever use of irony starting from the opening sentence. And Elizabeth Bennet is a very powerful character. They have, she and her father both have acute intelligence. And she has the capacity to change and transform. The novel is very deep. It is an analysis of class conflicts and social prejudices. Definitely marriage is a social issue, central issue in the novel. But the novel also deals with the financial aspects of marriage. Now I will talk to you about Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park is a novel that is very different from the other Austin novels because it has very disturbing themes and it's very complicated. Mansfield Park has a Cinderella-like protagonist, Fanny Price. She is unlike other Jane Austen heroines because she is weak and shy and always right. You know, that's not too good. She comes and lives with the Bertrams, her rich relatives. And the main theme of the novel is Fanny Price trying to find a social place. She is finding to find her role in the social order. The story takes place in Northamptonshire where the rich Bertrams live. Fanny Price comes from the poor Portsmouth. Portsmouth, remember, is the place where Charles Dickens also was born. Fanny's mother, Mrs. Price, is the sister of Lady Bertram. The Bertrams have two daughters, Maria and Julia. They are snobbish girls and also immoral. They constantly remind Fanny of her low social status. Then there are some sons. One of them, Edmund, is a very virtuous man and he's going to be a clergyman. Edmund, he's a hero who will eventually marry Fanny Price. Uncle Bertram has plantations in Antigua. And he leaves to Antigua where he has slaves. At that time, an attractive brother and sister, Henry Crawford and Mary Crawford, appear in, the Herf in Hertfordshire from London. They become friends with Julia and Maria and all of them engage in immoral activities. Henry is a flirt. He flirts with Maria and Julia and Mary is attracted to our Edmund. They also enact an immoral play, immoral in those days, considered immoral in those days, called Lover's Vows by Elizabeth Inchbald, which was about extramarital love and stuff like that. During the enactment of the play, Sir Bertram and unexpectedly returns and the play is stopped. That is a very important issue there. At this time, Maria is married to the boring man Rushworth and then Julia runs away with Yates. Maria, who is married, runs away with Henry Crawford. Both Maria and Julia bring shame upon the Bertram family. At the end, it becomes clear that Fanny, the patient little girl, not so little, <laughs> is the virtuous girl. And she is married by the virtuous Edmund. So this is how the Cinderella Ash girl is transformed into the princess. There is a very important element in Mansfield Park that was discussed by Edward Said in the book Culture and Imperialism. When Sir Bertram goes to Antigua, he has slaves there 
and Fanny asks him about slavery and she meets with dead silence. He doesn't reply to her. This is a pregnant pause and Edward Said has analyzed it like a kind of aporia. So now we discuss the next important novel, Emma. Emma is set in the village of Highbury, Emma Woodhouse. She is a 20 year old girl who accidentally leads to the match between her teacher, her governess, Miss Taylor and one Mr. Weston. They get married. He's a widower. And Emma thinks, oh, I'm good at matchmaking. You know, she's immature. And she unnecessarily meddles with people's affairs, thinking she can put them right. You shouldn't do it. That's immaturity. And you know, there is a poor orphan girl called Harriet Smith. She got a proposal from the local farmer Robert Martin. But Emma forces her to reject that proposal and says that Mr. Elton, the clergyman, will marry Harriet. <laughs> but Emma's plan is spoiled because when she tries to fix the match between Mr. Elton and Harriet, Mr. Elton proposes to Emma herself. And Emma had decided never to get married. She had been thinking that I'm good at matchmaking, that is my profession. I will never get married myself. Her neighbor and friend George Knightley keeps telling her, don't do all these things. She doesn't listen to him. They are thick friends. George Knightley likes her, but she has not yet recognized her love for Knightley. Meanwhile, there is a young man who comes to the village of Highbury. His, his name is Frank Churchill. Emma gets interested in Frank Churchill, despite our George Knightley's warnings. Eventually, uh, she d decides to get Harriet and Frank Churchill married only to discover that Frank Churchill is already engaged to another pretty girl who has also arrived in Highbury, Jane Fairfax. Harriet is heartbroken. One after the other, she is losing the men. And then Emma decides to do something about it. Then Harriet says, no, I want to marry George Knightley. <gasps> Emma is shocked. Because then she realizes that she loves George Knightley. Luckily, things are put right when George Knightley proposes to Emma. And Robert Martin again renews his proposal to Harriet. So both girls are married to men who are good enough for them. This is a typical domestic novel of an erring heroine learning her lessons, marrying the good male who was already there waiting for her. To be reformed. That is Emma. And the last novel is Persuasion, published posthumously along with Northanger Abbey. Persuasion, 1818, published. I've not told you the story of Northanger Abbey, I'll tell you after this. Persuasion has a mature heroine, Anne Elliot. She is in her 30s and these no both these novels, Persuasion and Northanger Abbey, are set in Bath, which is the uh, place of tourism and pretentious culture, superficial culture, vanity of the middle classes. And Persuasion is a novel about people getting second chances. Anne Elliot, eight years before the novel happens, Anne Elliot was engaged to one Frederick Wentworth. But at that time, her mother's friend, Lady Russell and others, discouraged her from marrying Wentworth because Wentworth was from the lower class and Eliot's family was aristocratic. Now, eight years later, Wentworth has become a captain and rich. Anne Eliot's family fortunes have de declined. Her father, Mr. Walter Elliot, sits all the time reading a book of baronetcy. In that book, he reads about his own family. But all that glory is now lost. The Elliots have to rent out their house, Kellynch Hall, in order to make some extra money. And do you know who are the tenants? Mr. and Mrs. Croft, Admiral Croft and his wife. And do you know who they are? the brother-in-law and sister of 
captain frederick wentworth look at the turn of events what a coincidence Eight years after Anne Elliot broke off her engagement, she's again facing Captain Wentworth. He is showing her a cold shoulder. He is not very much interested in Anne Elliot now. Of course, she needs to be taught a lesson. And he's more interested in the Musgrove sisters, Louisa and Henrietta. I don't have to tell you how the story turns out, it's obvious. This is a Jane Austen novel. How does the story turn out? At the end, obviously, Captain Wentworth proposes again to Anne Elliot. She accepts it. The woman has learned her lesson. So that is persuasion, relatively mature heroine. Very important is to note that this is set in the post-Napoleonic era. Wentworth's fortunes were made in the Napoleonic Wars. And in all these novels, Jane Austen has been very eff effectively using what is called free indirect discourse. The thoughts of the character, characters are blended into the narrative without speech marks, without indirect speech or direct speech, just saying the thoughts. That is called free indirect discourse, a technique used by Jane Austen. And now, which novel is remaining, tell me? I have not discussed one of the six novels. It is Northanger Abbey, the first written novel, showing the fortunes and adventures of the 17-year-old Catherine Morland. Catherine Morland is excessively fond of reading gothic novels. She has read Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho many times. Remember, women reading gothic novels was a problem in those days. Women reading novels, that itself is a problem. The suggestion in those times are, is that, in the novel is that, women who read novels turned out to think in wrong ways. They were corrupted by their reading. You know, like Madame Bovary was corrupted by her reading. Like Arabella in Female Quixote was misled by her reading. Women are corrupted by their reading is a suggestion. Catherine Morland visits Bath with her neighbors, the Allens. Bath is a place of superficial culture. And she makes a few friends there who are not very good people. The flirtatious Isabella Thorpe and her, has, uh, and her uh, brother, John Thorpe. John Thorpe is a rough-mannered man who is interested in Catherine, but Catherine doesn't like him. She also, Catherine also makes friends with Eleanor Tilney and Henry Tilney. Good people, Henry Tilney she falls in love with. Isabella is having affairs with many people at this time. Who is Isabella? The friend, Isabella Thorpe. Isabella has an affair with Catherine's brother, James Morland, thinking that James Morland must be rich. But then she discovers that he is not rich and she gives up on him. At this time, Catherine visits Northanger Abbey, which is Tilney's estate. There, General Tilney, the father of Henry Tilney is there. And Catherine Mollen has never seen such a gothic mansion before. She has never been to such a house before that is so visibly gothic. And she starts imagining that there must be a tyrant here. General Tilney must be a tyrant. He must have imprisoned his wife and killed her. She is imagining some passionate story of murder and revenge and all that. And when Henry Tilney comes to know this is what the stupid girl is thinking he gives her one speech remember we are English and we are Christians don't think such thoughts be God fearing that is what Henry Tilney teaches her at that time the vengeful John Thorpe who was rebuffed by Catherine gives General Tilney the news that Catherine is penniless and General Tilney does not want her, his son Henry to marry Catherine but Henry disobeys his father and proposes to Catherine finally General Tilney also accepts so this is more like a Bildungsroman 
A Bildung's Roman is a story of the development of a character. Catherine's foolish and fantastic expectations of the world are exposed by Henry Tilney's maturity and confidence in the world. And patriotism, 18th century nationalism, all these are there in this novel. So, this novel marks the uh, beginning as well as end of uh, Jane Austen's canon. There are a couple of other novels like Lady Susan, it's an epistolary novel. The Watsons, that is also uh, another novel that she has written. Jane Austen's nephew, J. E. Austen Lay, wrote a memoir of Jane Austen. That is very important. Then there is a fragmentary novel, Sanditon, that uh, she was working on at the time she died. Remember, Jane Austen novels are all novels of domestic realism. In domestic realism, social hypocrisy is usually exposed through irony. Characters are usually middle class and provincial characters, not very metropolitan uh, aristocratic characters. Their courtship and marriage, their stereotypical social roles will be the theme of the novel. The heroines may be erring, they will undergo a process of education and their life will end in marriage. There are two, three different kinds of types of women and types of men that are represented in domestic realism and the domestic realist novels also contain fairy tale elements. Austin wrote in a very tight style, controlled style parodying the sentimentality of the 18th century, perfecting free indirect discourse and depicting intelligent, fearless heroines. At the beginning, Jane Austen was not very much appreciated, but it was in the 1940s that a very seminal article called Regulated Hatred, D.W. Harding was the author of the article, Regulated Hatred, an aspect of the work of Jane Austen came in 1940. That started what is called Jane Austen cult. And Jane Austen was reduced to a level in British literature from which she has never descended. All the novels of Jane Austen as well as all these important writers and their works are uh, detailed in our encyclopedia of British literature. This white one is the second volume. First volume is up to the 18th century, end of the 18th century. Second volume is on 19th and third volume is on the 20th. I am just informing you, everything is covered in point point form. If you read this encyclopedia along with these videos, you will be able to understand much deeply and uh, you will know a lot of points that are necessary for the exam. I hope you liked this video on Jane Austen. Thank you very much. Read these books if you can. Enjoy them. At least watch the adaptations, the movies. Okay guys, bye bye. See you in the next video.